Welcome to the Big Seance Podcast. I'm Patrick Keller of BigSeance.com, and this is a place for an open discussion on all things paranormal, but specifically topics like ghosts and hauntings, paranormal research, spirit communication, psychics and mediums, and life after death. So basically, anything that pops up in my paranormal world. The candles are already lit, so you might as well come on in and join the seance. Y'all, today I am talking with uh, the co-founders and another wonderful member of the Morning Society of St. Louis. And this is a group that I have had my eyes on for uh, like 10 years now, but they go back earlier than that. And let me just read you their description because it's a, a really unique group here in St. Louis. And I just kind of decided I keep bugging Sherry, which is one of the members you're going to meet. She is a listener of the podcast. The last several years, I keep bugging her with questions, uh, curious questions about this group. And, you know, I'm still kind of thinking about whether I might want to join this group or try to join it. I don't know that they'd have me, but try to join this group. And I just decided, you know what? Why don't I do an episode about this and let's interview these cool peeps? So here's this is from their website, which is, by the way, morningsociety.com. I was impressed that you all have the only morningsociety.com website. That's pretty cool. We are a St. Louis, Missouri based civilian reenacting group with an interest in mourning, death culture, spiritualism and the funeral customs of the mid-19th century through the early 20th century. Our main focus is public educational events. The Morning Society has participated in events with our partners at Bell Fountain Cemetery, the Campbell House Museum, the St. Louis Public Library, Jefferson Barracks Historic Site, Missouri History Museum, the General Daniel Bissell House, the Field House Museum, Lafayette Park Conservancy, and the Stephen and Peter Sachs Museum at the Missouri Botanical Garden. And, oh my gosh, if you just Google Morning Society, it's the first thing that pops up. And if you Google Morning Society of St. Louis, there are so many really beautiful images. And if you follow them on social media, there are beautiful images taken over the years, some by different media outlets, some by just individuals. I've taken some photos at a few events, and it is just really fascinating. And if you are a fan of this podcast and like our topics, this is right up your alley. It is really cool. The first event I went to was in 2014. Uh, it was a event on death and mourning, mourning practices at uh, one of the mansions in St. Louis beautiful mansion. And then I think the next year I went to a funeral event at Bell Fountain Cemetery, the beautiful Bell Fountain Cemetery in St. Louis. And so they have really, really cool educational events. And the big media here in St. Louis, St. Louis Post-Dispatch has several really cool articles on this group. And the St. Louis NPR station, I think, has done things. They've had other interviews. They're really worth checking out. So let me introduce you to some peeps. So today we're going to talk to Edna Dieterle and Catherine Kozemchek, who are the co-founders of the group and also a listener of our show and a member of the group, Sherry Morrow. So I am so, so excited. Welcome to the Big Seance Podcast. Thanks. Hi, Patrick. Thank you for having us. So, Catherine, let's start with you. Where did this incredibly unique group come from and how did it start? Well, Edna and I were working together at the Demonel Mansion. We'd been volunteers for a long time and we were both on the board, but our primary function was we ran volunteers, but we also did 
educational events. And so morning was an idea that Edna came up with to do an event all around that because she had gone to a house museum in Mississippi and she had seen one room of their house decorated for morning and she was just kind of enchanted by it. So she talked to everybody about it and she called them up and asked them permission because she didn't want them to feel like we were copying them, you know. <laughs> and uh, then she, uh, we decided to to do it for October. And there was, I, there was some, I think, trepidation on the part of like other people there because they thought maybe it was like too weird or it was like a little too dark. But we were like, no, we'll be fine. So we, the first one that we did was in 2005, and that was really like a trial run. We didn't really know what we were doing, but all the rest of the year we were planning other events. But that was really the one that we both loved so much like we really focused on improving that and we started both like collecting things to like show at the events like Edna has a whole collection of coffins in her basement you know <laughs> um, and neat yeah like antique coffins antique uh, anything you can think of that was related to the event we started you know so every year we would have this whole crate of stuff that we would bring and unpack and like load the house up with all these things you're those neighbors yes yeah the ones that like <laughs> roll the coffins out and then <laughs> And people are like, I I mean, all the time when I leave the house dressed up, too, I get like a lot of weird looks from people like driving up and down the street. But uh, <laughs> and it's not always morning, but, you know, it is a little strange sight, I guess, to see people walking around in clothes like that. So after we had done the event at Demonil for 10 years and we'd really kind of perfected it, it was it got to the point where it was rote. We, we would switch things up every once in a while, but we knew what we were doing to the point where it got a lot easier. Um, and in that time, John Avery had joined us as the undertaker, and he's a great reenactor that um, actually worked as a funeral director in real life. And then he sort of transitioned that into like his reenacting persona of being the undertaker. And he was such an expert that he really helped us a lot. And we picked up a lot of volunteers along the way that were just really interested in that topic, and they would just come for that event every year. And so in 2015, we had parted ways with Dem and Il, both of us, and we were a bit homeless because we knew that... We wanted to take that event with us somewhere, but we had kind of just said, well, maybe we'll just let it fade away, you know, <laughs> but we were talking to uh, Dan at uh, Bell Fountain Cemetery and we had talked to him about maybe talking to a few other houses and he said, no, don't talk to them. Talk to me. I want to do it here. So we had to come up with a whole new scenario because we weren't in a house anymore doing morning. We were actually at the cemetery. So then we had to say what would happen here and how would it be different? We had to like write a funeral service. We had to you know, plan like who all the characters were that would be there that would be different than what would be at home. And so we formed the Morning Society specifically because we were moving the event to Bell Fountain. And I mean, we had all of our players because we all knew each other already from Demonel. And Dan was like, you should come up with a name for your group. And so that's what I think John Avery actually is the one who came up with the name Morning Society. So that's how it started. The first year, that's all we did was just the Bell Fountain event in 2015. And then after that, we sort of added a few things on here and there, begrudgingly, no. <laughs> on my part. <laughs> but um, but now we have, I think, like about five or six rotating events every year. And then just a couple of, you know, standalones that we kind of throw in there every once in a while. Some of which do involve being in a home, right? A historic home, right? Yeah. Now we're at the Campbell House, which we do something similar where we have like the wake in the parlor and we talk about you know, Robert Campbell's wake and all the things that they would have done in the house when someone died. And some of the things are the same every year, but we try to switch up and do different topics that are sort of related to the family or to like the Victorian period in general, all kinds of different things. So that's kind of fresh every time. Well, I just want to say thank you, John, for the inspiration for that amazing name. And so you really are kind of the first organization like this. There are other civilian reenacting groups that specialize in like dancing and other things. There's a few groups that do, um, I think there's one that does, there's like specific cemeteries where they'll go and they'll just dress up as widows and they'll do some programming. But I don't, I don't know of any other groups that are like us. That are this built out and yeah. have such a cool history, I would say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This grown. Yeah. People just you know, contact me and they say, you know, I want to start a morning society where we are. And I'm like, I mean, good luck to you, but I don't know. It's just like a weird <laughs> set of circumstances that fell into place. Like, do you have a person with a basement full of coffins? Probably not. <laughs> do you have a person who's an expert on 19th century funerals? Maybe. I don't know. Find one and you're good to go, but it's hard. you know. So now you have a number of regular events at Bell Fountain Cemetery, and it's beautiful I have been to at least one of the events, and it was around 2015, around that time 
that you first started going out there. But tell us more specifically about some of those events at Bell Fountain. Well, we um, do a recreation of a Victorian funeral where part of the event is an explanation because people, I think, walk into it having like a preconceived notion of what they're going to see. And, you know, we draw them in. It's October. It's a cemetery. We're all going to be dressed up in like spooky looking black clothing. But then they come in and we tell them about like real things that happened in St. Louis. Like we did one all about the cholera epidemic in 1865 and told them all the details about the crazy things that were going on in the city, how people were fleeing. And there were all these like patent medicines you could buy if you couldn't leave the city that were going to keep you from getting cholera. There was a temporary morgue that was built near the old arsenal and the people in the neighborhood were so worried about all the bodies in the morgue, like making them sick that they went and they tricked the guards away from it and they set it on fire and burned the whole thing down. It was a crazy time to live in St. Louis. And so we, the setup is that you do a tour of the cemetery where you go to these stations where someone will tell you about these things, like what it was like to be ill with cholera, what it was like to treat it and all these things that were happening in the city. And then you arrive at the chapel and we have a funeral for a person who died from cholera and who is buried, a real person who is buried there at Bell Fountain. And we have a minister who does a sermon. We don't do a whole Victorian funeral because modern audiences don't really have the patience for like a two hour long sermon, you know, <laughs> um, but, uh, but we do as much as we can. It doesn't fit on a TikTok video. So <laughs> yeah, it's really, it's, you don't want to see that, but we do, you know, we go into the chapel, we have the service, we have the pallbearers take the coffin, we go to the graveside, we do a short graveside service and we process, you know, and I think that, you know, it's the, People like seeing us do those things, and that is part of the enjoyment of it. But also, we want to try to sprinkle in those facts, maybe things that people didn't know or didn't realize about the time period. So, so two things I wanted to say, at least at the event at Bell Fountain at the cemetery, it's really striking when you're seeing it for the first time. I mean, depending on you know what your interests are, I mean, it could be. It could really affect somebody to tears because you guys do a really good job of being, you know, we could say in character and just seeing the the clothing and the black and the, you know, the coffins. And, and I think you guys often do a children's coffin, too, like, like a children's funeral, which would have happened a lot back then. Yeah. And um, I've even seen, you know, is John Avery still around with his historic hearse? I mean, that hearse is, oh, uh, <laughs> I mean, you see that it's ju it just hits you and you really do feel like you're back in, in time. Yeah, we make a concerted effort to try to keep that part of the cemetery like free of cars driving around so that when you're watching us, you're seeing like what it would have looked like as much as possible <laughs> in the 19th century rather than, you know, seeing too many modern things moving around in the background. Yeah. So. John Avery is also a big part of our group. I'm glad you mentioned his hearse because now John is semi-retired. And so his hearse is uh, now Belfont Cemetery has bought the hearse. So it's always at our events now. But John has been such a, oh my gosh, contributing factor as far as knowledge and expertise. And so he's also an integral part of our group. The other question that, that I thought of in my mind when you're talking about well, both the house events but and the, the cemetery events are, this takes some research, right? I would think if you're yeah. a, a member of this group and you do these events, you're kind of doing some continuing education of your of yourself, right? Oh, yes. Yes, yeah. Because we always have to try to make it fresh, too. If you come every year, there's some things you're always going to see, but we try to freshen it with, like, new topics. And we've created new events around different topics, too, that are kind of related to mourning in different ways. So it's we're always trying to learn more things and make it more accurate to the time period using period sources for the materials that we're producing. So it's not just, you know, people have a lot of preconceived notions about the Victorian period, which are just not correct, you know. So we try to fix that. But, but that's a constant learning process for us, too, because we have to try to erase those things from our own minds that we've maybe learned throughout the years that weren't correct. Sherry, yeah. tell us what drew you to this group. Why are you now a member of the Morning Society of St. Louis? Well, I actually attended the same event that you attended at Bell Fountain Cemetery the first year that they did it there. And I was just so awestruck with everything that these ladies did. And I came away like, oh, these are my people. <laughs> 
So I contacted Catherine and I have been a member ever since then. And these ladies are so wonderful and I just love them to death. And we work together so well. I guess the next question I have is, oh, the clothing, (laughs) the garb, the I don't know if you'd call them costumes or what you'd call them, but I'm curious to know, you know, where you get these costumes, if they are authentic, if they if they were made, if you purchased them, if you have a whole closet full of them. I just (laughs) I have questions about that. I could talk a little bit about that. I would say some people in the group like Sherry, she makes many of her dresses. I do not. I don't sew a lick. So I have to buy mine. But (laughs) you can get custom. There's people who specialize in making Victorian clothing, you know, reproduction clothing. And there's different levels of like how accurate you want to get. Obviously, we want to make it. We all want to be like at the same level, but we don't want to make it like restrictive for new people who are getting started. So there's some corners you can cut, you know. Um, You must purchase this $5 million (laughs) closet of clothes. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, yeah, we were going to do an 1879 event and I had priced out a dress, you know, to have someone custom make me a dress because I don't have a dress for 1879. And it was outrageous. I did not end up doing it. And that event got canceled because of COVID. So I kind of lucked out, but it was it was going to be a lot of money. Yeah, (laughs) I was like, oh, my God, I'm sweating thinking about this dress. I was gonna say 1860s is a little easier because there's a lot of people who do it. So you can buy things lightly used sometimes online and get them fitted or you can get a dress custom made for a little bit cheaper because people it's just more available. You know, if you want to get really niche, like I need 1883 or something, you might and you're going to probably drop a, a lot of money on it. but mm-hmm. And all the underwear is different every 10 years. For women, it's a lot harder. <laughs> yeah. I said, yeah, like I really know. Um, <laughs> Edna, there are so many photos out there of you in particular. And just the beautiful, you know, gown that you, I guess, typically wear. Do you, do you have yeah. others? Tell us about your look, your style. <laughs> Always in mourning, it seems like. I do have other dresses, too, and I occasionally get to wear one of those, but usually I'm mourning because I'm the widow. My dress was made for me by a lady probably oh, 25 years ago, I guess, and it's showing its wear. I seem to sort of come apart. I'm trying to repair it all the time because I, I just really like that dress. But it, one thing I want to say about black fabric, it is truly is hot. It When we did an event one October, it was 90 degrees, and, um, we, and the guys were in little frock coats and top hats and we were all in black and it was pretty toasty. But so um, yeah, when you get all the undergarments on, uh, which you can fudge on some, but the corset's important, uh, which is not the most comfortable thing. But And then the veil over your face. Sherry's got a beautiful silk veil that's just lovely. Um, so we all try to do the, our best to make it as accurate as we can. We have other dresses. You just normally see me as the widow and I have a veil over my face. So people don't usually recognize me when we, they see me without my garb on. I was talking to my husband at dinner tonight before this interview, and I was just basically going through all the questions with him that I had. And one of the the main ones was like, you would have to be pretty passionate to do this regularly. And I realized that not everything is a, you know, you're not always in mourning for every event. But what is it like being in this mournful um, kind of character so much and then going home to your regular modern life. And I, it just makes me wonder if it affects how you either live your life or, you know, if it's not too personal, how it is changed, how you mourn, I guess, in your real life. Uh, because, you know, mourning customs, as we know, obviously in the Victorian times are much modern day society are, we're criticized for, how we run away from death, I guess, and we don't have a really good relationship with it. So I wondered, how does that work? Yeah, just for me personally, I I admire how the Victorians mourn more so than how we do it now. Now it's like you said, it's people don't want to face it or it's a thing of, you know, get over it. It's been long enough. You need to move on. You need to put that behind you now. And it's like, no, you can't do that. And the Victorians in that era, especially, well, there's so much death the civil war, child mortality, illness, disease, all that. So lots of people were dying. They had to deal with it and they didn't just get over it. Women, if, if you could afford to, would mourn a, would for three years for their husband. Um, in different stages, you were getting more out of your mourning stage as it went on, but they knew how to mourn and, and to give yourself time to heal and uh, to just, yeah, give yourself the time that you need. 
So I think it's made me sometimes when, when we all, we've all lost loved ones. And, and I hate that when somebody says, Oh, it's, it's been long enough. You need to be over that now. It's like, no, no, no. Everybody mourns at their own pace. And the Victorians really respected that and respected when someone was in mourning. They didn't try to encourage them to get out of it. Um, they let them experience that. When you're in the clothing, it brings it home to you. When you put on that garb, you're that person. It, it just does it. And then when you, when you go home and you take it off, then it's over. But then you're ready to get out of the corset anyway. <laughs> but um, anyway, that's how I see it. <laughs> yeah. By the time that the event's over, yeah, you want, you're pretty ready to get out of the corset. Like Edwin was saying, when you put this on, you're kind of taking on that whole persona and what you have researched and everything that you've learned from what you're going to be talking about that day is kind of there with you. And, you know, when you have the veil over your face and people, you know, they kind of look at you and they're almost afraid to approach you and you have to like, you know, tell them, come on, come on, come on closer. <laughs> But by the end of the day, after after a whole day of this, you know, it's kind of symbolic when you take off all of the, the morning clothes, you kind of leave the morning there and then you can go on with the rest of your life. At least that's the way I do it, because it, a lot of it does affect you. I was going to say that through reading all the personal stories of people and like books of poetry that people wrote after losing a loved one in the 19th century and the photos and all the jewelry and things that we collect, you know, that we have. I feel like it, it kind of makes you face like your own mortality because all these people who created all these things are now gone, you know, and they got through it. Like they went through the same thing you're going through and they use these things and they got through it and lived the rest of their life and now they're gone and now you're, you know, so I, I think it does make it easier to deal with a little bit, you know, because you're facing it all the time. And I also think that I like that in the Victorian period that people wore mourning on the outside like that so that other people knew to treat them kindly. You know, like when you're out in the world now, you don't know who's going through a hard time. You know, when somebody cuts you off in their car or whatever, or like it, something happens because their mind is on something horrible that happened to them. Like you don't know that. And so you're, you know, going to lash out and be angry at that person or, or maybe treat them unkindly in a situation where they cut you in line or something. But then they looked at that person and they said, oh, I have to be gentle with this person because they're in mourning, you know. And I, I just like that because people have compassion when they, I mean, they maybe should think maybe they're going through a hard time. But, you know, that would be an instant symbol to you to be like, oh, you know, this person is dealing with something. So maybe I shouldn't be as angry with them as I normally would. I, I like that idea. But today we don't have an equivalent to that. You know, everybody, I mean, everybody's going through something, obviously, but there's some people who are having it a worse time than others, but we all look the same. <laughs> so you can't really tell. That's a really, really great point. I had a lady approach me one time and said that she wished that at least to some degree that we still practiced a little bit of this in the modern days. Because then if you see somebody like at the grocery store stopping at the apples, who just, you know that, oh, they just lost somebody that they cared about. So you know, you're a little kinder to them than you would normally just like, okay, somebody's crying at the apples. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I haven't done it in a long time, but I used to be really into cemetery photography, not necessarily like, like genealogy type of cemetery photography, but I love finding, you know, especially older forgotten cemeteries and taking beautiful photos. Cause I, to me, it is so beautiful. You know, you think of the park-like setting of Bell Fountain, for example. I feel the same way about the little, tiny, hidden, forgotten cemeteries. And I have gotten some comments from people who don't get it or think that is really rude that you're going and taking a photo of a cemetery. And I'm like, do you, do you see the beauty in this photo, first of all? Like, I'm, I would hope that the person who's resting there would appreciate that I was seeing the beauty in it and not treating it, you know, anyway, I'm going down this rabbit hole. But well, you know, and the person who created that monument did it so that person would be remembered, you know, true. and now you're remembering them. True. So that makes me think that you probably understand this. I wondered if there were people in your life or who have just maybe responded to the group who don't appreciate what you do and think it's weird? Or do you get criticism from people who just aren't educated, I guess? 
I don't know. Not a lot. I mean, I think most people that don't like the group are just creeped out. Maybe <laughs> like they're uncomfortable with death. And so they just don't want to like there was I would say there was one TV personality I won't name him that we always wanted to like get on the show like on this new show and he would not have anything to do with us because he was just creeped out by the topic he was like that's weird I can't do it and so I don't think it was against us it was just his own (laughs) his own personal demons (laughs) Um, yeah but I yeah so I mean nobody really says you shouldn't be doing it but I think it's not for everybody because some people are uncomfortable with the idea of death especially now I think I mean, there is a movement, obviously, now, I think, especially now, to be more death positive, but for a long time, there was nothing like that. And so people are like, let's just pretend it's not going to happen to me, you know? <laughs> oh, And we're a glaring reminder that it is, it ha- this happens to everybody. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I have a Memento Mori ring that I wear that says Carpe Diem. Oh. That's supposed to remind you that death finally comes for all of us in the end. <laughs> yeah. I've literally had somebody look at me when they found out that I was a part of this group and go, cemeteries, ill. <laughs> and I'm like, mm, okay. I love cemeteries. My husband has learned when we're on vacation or something, if I, uh, if I point and if he's like, okay, he's pulling over because I've spotted the cemetery, we have to go through it. Because it's so many different states, they're so different. And I, I take pictures of the stones because the iconography tends to differ. If somebody goes, like my son went to Hawaii and he said, oh my God, take pictures of cemeteries. I have never been to Hawaii. I don't know what a Hawaiian cemetery looks like. So I like to know how different areas handle burials and and they're great history lessons. Oh my gosh. And like Catherine was saying, people put those stones up to be remembered. And I think when I'm walking through a cemetery, I feel like it's almost welcoming. Like, you know, thank you for being here. Um, they want to be remembered. They're people too. Uh, so cemeteries are just a reminder that we all, we're all going to be there someday. So, yeah. Catherine, you mentioned earlier, uh, I guess something about misconceptions that are out there. Do you ever see things in uh, like either films or TV or other representations of funerals of the time or, you know, Victorian mourning? You know, does Hollywood and like TV, do they tend to get it right? One of the things I think I see a lot is that they'll have every person at the funeral in black, which usually would not have been like not everyone who went would be in mourning. So if you were not closely related to the person, like only the close family would be in mourning. So if you were like somebody who was not and you showed up in mourning, that would be considered kind of presumptuous of you. Mm that you would be in mourning for this person. So like most of the people at the funeral might just be in their Sunday best. They probably wouldn't be wearing bright colors, but they would be wearing something, you know, somber, but they wouldn't be yeah. in a veil and all that stuff. But often you would see, like I see it in movies that like every person is in black at the funeral, which just wasn't really something that you would have seen in real life. Although most people will see a lot of historical photos and they'll say, well, this woman is in mourning. And I'm like, it's a black and white picture. All the dresses look black. I don't know how you could tell. True. That's true. Yeah. I think that's such a strange thing. They'll just post any picture of any dress. She's in mourning. I'm like, it's, I don't know how you know that. And also wet plate photography is a whole other interesting topic where colors look very strange. Like there's like these charts of like, you could have like a yellow dress that would like look black, you know, and things like mm. that. It's very, so the way that their photography worked is entirely different too. So our eyes are looking at something that we don't really even understand. That is one, you know, that everybody would yeah. be black. So I often at the Bellfound event, I don't, I wear something other than black because I just want to show people like there would be someone there who was not in mourning. Edna, do you know of any other misconceptions that are out there that bug you? Not off the top of my head. Or do you want to talk about tear catchers? Yeah. <laughs> So, you know, when we started all this, because I'm always intrigued by, ooh, this is, you know, kind of kitschy and cool. And stuff. and so, um, tear catchers, they're glass vials. In fact, I have a whole bunch of them. They're over there. Um, anyway, they're beautiful glass vials, about this tall and cylindrical, and they're painted with flowers and beautiful things on the side. And they were promoted as being tear catchers. And I thought, this is really cool. And I was collecting them. And, and I have about 12 of them, I guess, because the, the story goes that when someone would die, you would cry, you, you collect your tears in this vial, seal it with wax. And then after the person's been dead for a year and a day, you could pour your tears across the grave and that signified the end of your mourning period. It sounded so cool to me. And I just love that idea. I love the romantic idea of it. It was just really neat. 
But then Catherine's our expert debunker. Give her a, a cool idea and she's going to find the falsity behind it. And so <laughs> <laughs> thanks a lot, Catherine. I just can't help myself. <laughs> she's the bubble burster. Yeah. But so she found out because she was starting to research as far as, well, if there's all these, because we have, there's Jay's House of Mourning. There's all these mourning catalogs where you can order, you know, handkerchiefs with black trim and mourning fans and mourning accoutrements, all the stuff that people would buy when they're in mourning. But never did she see one that had an ad for tear catchers. Yeah, I can't find any reference that is like contemporary to the Victorian period of this. Like the earliest things I can find are on the internet from maybe like the early 2000s yeah. or something. And I mean, I think it's widely been debunked now by other people too. I would always say to people like, I can't say in a hundred, like no woman ever caught her tears in a bottle and poured them over a grave. But was it like a mass produced thing that was made for that? I would say probably not because you can't find advertisements for it. You can't find anybody talking about doing it. They're perfume bottles is what they were. Yeah. So I have a beautiful perfume bottle collection <laughs> that used to be a tear. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting too, because if you go to the Steamship Arabia Museum yes. in Kansas City, they have these perfume bottles, they're smaller than the ones Edna has, but they look very similar and they still have the perfume in them mm -hmm. because they were just like sealed into the ship, you know, when it sunk. And so they're definitely perfume bottles. But like I said, do I know that like one Victorian woman didn't use a perfume bottle to catch her tears? No, I don't know that. But was it something everyone was doing? No. I'm sure it comes from one story mm -hmm. that was passed along or I think whatever. someone who was selling those perfume bottles on eBay made it. <laughs> That's what I think. Yeah. And there you go. Because those were worth nothing until they were tear catchers. And then they were like 300 bucks a piece or something. <laughs> I remember reading somewhere about how Victorians of a certain stature would sometimes, and I forget what they called them, but they would hire usually women to like sob and be overly dramatic and, you know, mourn in character because it would have been seen as that must be a really important person, you know, because there are these loudly, overly obnoxious women sobbing and mourning in black. Is that a was that a thing? No, usually um, like outward displays of emotion like that were frowned upon, mm. like at funerals. And in fact, a lot of times women did not attend the funerals at all because men were like, they can't control their emotions and they're going to cry in front of everybody. At one point, we had talked about the funeral of Henry Shaw at one of our events, and he actually forbid any women to go to the funeral. So even though his sister and like his housekeeper and all those people were at the wake and then they were at the procession afterward and the burial, they didn't go to the funeral. They were, He said he didn't want them there. Mm -hmm. And that, that was not uncommon for a woman to even not go to her husband's funeral. Yeah, Mary Lincoln didn't go to President Lincoln's funeral. Yeah. Because they couldn't contain themselves. Because they were very outward about the fact that they were in mourning and wore all this black and veils and all. And that seems very dramatic. But, you know, you weren't allowed to just like collapse or cry. Or, that was not, I mean, not, a, not not allowed, but it was like not something that they really wanted to see. They were like, no, everyone should be more stoic. Interesting. Well, there you go. You debunked this big idea that I've always had in my head since I read that. <laughs> if anybody was doing that, it wasn't in the United States, that I should say. I don't know about other places, but I haven't ever seen that here. I mean, it's, some of it does seem very melodramatic, but like in real life where people like that, I don't think so. I think they tended to be more stoic in that time. It was kind of, you know, keep it all inside <laughs> and cry when you're at home. Speaking of, you know, the difference between like the states and other countries, I asked the members of the Big Seance Parlor, which is the Facebook group for my podcast, which Sherry is a member of. And I let them know yesterday that we were going to have this conversation and asked if anybody had any questions. And this is a question from Tim Neal, who is in Britain. And he says, in Britain, there used to be a custom of closing all the curtains of upstairs rooms as a sign of respect upon the death of a family member. Was this custom carried out in the United States? I don't know that one specifically. I would say usually the house was kind of shut down, you know, because 
one of the things about the 19th century is that that we don't have have I mean I guess we have like Instacart and stuff but you know you had a lot of people come to the house for like services you know like people selling things and like people were always coming to the house and so there were ways of like marking the house to be like oh a death has occurred so don't ring the doorbell you know so it was kind of like that you know they would definitely shut all the curtains of the house because well one of the reasons for that is because they wanted to keep the house cool because you have a dead body in the house so it's a practical reason as well I remember going to the event at the mansion and seeing the the black Mm -hmm. crepe drapery over all of the mirrors. And I remember people seeing my pictures that I took and I blogged about it and people asking me like, that is so interesting. That looks so creepy, first of all, but why are there? And I I remember having to do some research to answer people's questions Why did we put black drapery across mirrors? That's an interesting question. It's funny because when we talk about that at events, I would try to find, you know, things from the 19th century. And I found a newspaper article. It was like a question and answer, you know, thing from like the 1870s where someone was asking that exact same question. Why do we do this? You know, like they didn't (laughs) know, you know, because it's so old, like superstitions around mirrors are so old. Yeah. They come from, you know, way farther back than the 19th century. So they were still doing things that people had been doing for a long time. And there's a lot of superstitions around mirrors, like breaking mirrors and things, because mirrors were sort of like magical objects to people for a long time. And so there are superstitions like the next person to look in the mirror after the person who had died would be the next person to die. There are superstitions about the spirit being trapped in the mirror, like the spirit was in the home while the body was in the home. And so they would keep them covered until the body was gone so that the spirit would leave, you know. So it's a lot of different, it's kind of an amalgamation of a lot of different superstitions surrounding mirrors. And also it was a time of introspection. You weren't supposed to be vain and like look at yourself in the mirror too. You know, it was like your focus is on the spiritual, not the physical. So those mirrors are just a distraction for you. So it's it's a complex, that's a complex answer, I guess. And that we don't really know (laughs) the answer to either. (laughs) Tim also asks, Uh, He says, as a custom, um, a Victorian custom of placing coins over the eyes of the deceased. And he wondered if that happened in the U.S. as well. I think sometimes it depends on the culture of the people who, because we, I think we've seen a few Mm postmortems where they had coins on the eyes. Yeah. Because like everything else in the United States were like a cultural melting pot. Yeah. You know, you had like all of these customers from different countries coming together. So it would depend on the family and whether that was a tradition for them or not. So yes, just sometimes yeah. people were doing that. I think sometimes they did it to hold the eyelids down and then also to the rumor yeah. of paying the ferryman. Yeah. For sure, they had to treat the body so that the eyes wouldn't stay mm-hmm. open <laughs> when they were at home, you know, when they were treating the body at home. That makes sense. I'm yeah. assuming it also is kind of the same thing of coins on headstones. Those are like like tokens, like I've been here. I think, what is it? If it's a mm. penny, it's, it's I've been here. It's more of, it started as a military thing, I believe, that a penny meant, you know, I've been here to visit the grave. A nickel was, I served with a person or something, and a dime was something else. And then a quarter was, I was present when this person was killed in action. So are there any other events that you guys want to talk about? I don't think I've attended a wake event. I think it was different than the first event. Um, are there any other events we haven't talked about? At Campbell House, we do a thing where we have something different in every room. We have, um, they have, Campbell House sets up a coffin in the parlor and they have floral arrangements and everything as from a picture of when Robert Campbell was being viewed in the parlor of his home. So, and we have someone in there talking about that part of it. And then we usually have Sherry and another member, John, are in the dining room talking about um, mourning customs for w- women and men, the difference between how long women would mourn and the clothing and how short men would mourn. And then um, we go upstairs. We have a, usually I do a medical, sh- I'm a retired nurse. So I've always been fascinated by the medical aspects of all this stuff. So I have things related to the sick room. I usually get leeches. Uh, the leeches are another star of the show. We have live leeches um, and we talk about how they did them in, with bloodletting and all that. Then we go on to Catherine's in a room about another aspect, either postmortem photography or something like that. And then they go up to the library where Dan Fuller from Belfont Cemetery is usually uh, talking about the uh, Campbell plot at Belfont Cemetery. So that's a, we've been at Campbell every year now for quite a few years, but that's a lot of fun doing that one. That's a neat one. And then this year we were at the Magic Chef Mansion, which was the first time we were there, which was spectacular. 
Um, that house is fabulous. And she was open an open house and we acted as the docents. There were several of us in different rooms. We do things authentically, like historically accurate. This was more fun. It was like spooky, like she had skeletons and chairs and things, which was, it, it, we just had a really good time doing that. Was this the spiritualism event that you had? That was at the General Bissell House. Mm-hmm. And okay. the spiritualism event is kind of, we do it in July. Well, we have so many events in October <laughs> that we can't do it in October because we're just exhausted. But it's a really interesting event. I wish we could do it in October because people are more primed for it than I think. Because I almost showed up to this one. I saw this online and I was like, O-M-G, yeah. this is my jam. <laughs> it's really interesting. I, it's a really interesting topic. And I think it's another topic that people have a lot of misconceptions about. Yeah. Like uh, one of the things that I discovered when researching it is that like a lot of people now like relate like tarot and all that stuff to it. But this, the spiritualists at that time, they did not want to be associated with people that they considered fortune tellers <laughs> they were like we're not that you know they were they were like more serious you know depending on the person but there was definitely an interest at the at the same time in occultism but they weren't really considered to be part and parcel of the same thing but there were people who were very famous spiritualists and we talk about the fox sisters of course you know but there's a lot of other ones that were really famous at the time and no one knows anything about them now you know they don't really get talked about much so we we go through and we talk about different aspects of it like we talk about the history of it a talk about the different communication devices and how they evolved over time between like the alphabet cards and the planchettes and all these different things and ending up with the Ouija board, of course, later on. And then we talk about different spiritualists from the, the time period. But the the highlight of the event is that we have what I would call like a play, a seance play that we wrote where we try to darken the room as much as possible, which is kind of hard to do. But uh, we essentially put on a play where multiple people in the room are, you know, in their Victorian clothing and they perform a seance. We usually have like one audience member in the seance as well. And we wrote the script with several like real accounts of seances from the period. And there's multiple. Oh, interesting. (laughs) One of them is from a trial that was for some people in St. Louis that were put on trial for fraud because their seance was fake um, because she she would go into the spirit cabinet and take off her dress and leave the dress on the chair. So it looked like there was, she was still in there. And then she would like come out in her underwear essentially. And that was like a huge scandal about the trial that she was, she was like leaving her dress in the cabinet. But, um, you know, she would put her hair around her chin and make it look like she had a beard if she was supposed to be a man, like a male ghost. <laughs> but so that's uh, clearly was a fake sounds because they did catch her in the act. But there's also, I, I kind of combined elements of that with some other people who were spiritualists who talked about their real experiences at seances because I want to kind of point at it from both times because just because there were fraudsters at the time doesn't mean that no one had a real experience so I feel like we have to kind of present it from both angles but of course we can't have a real seance because I mean I don't know I think this whole house is haunted from the last time we were there but we can't guarantee that they're going to show up so we do have to fake some things obviously but we don't make any qualms about telling people that that's what we're doing at the event. So, um, well, I love it because everything else about the Morning Society is staged for education. So yes. why not that? Yes, we have to stage the ghosts. <laughs> but, but yeah, so I did. I did try to like write it from both angles and like use a couple of different. I have like I think like three different seances accounts of seances that I used. One of them being the trial. The other two being from people who thought they had a, a real experience at the time and. One of them was very creepy, so I would definitely wanted to use that. That was the only one I found that was kind of scary. So I was like, ooh, I want to use some of the lines that the ghost says from this one particular seance. And I think it turned out well. And we've kind of made some adjustments to it over time as we've done it. But Oh, man, I love it. <laughs> it's, it's a fun event. Do you plan on having that be a regular event? Yeah, yeah. It will be every July at the Bissell House. That is, uh, well, you're going to see me there at the next one. Good. You could be in the seance with us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. One of my last questions before we wrap up is there might be people listening who are obviously not in the St. Louis area, and they might be interested in either finding a similar group or maybe what kind of person are you looking for to be members of this group? I'm going to make a joke and say we need pallbearers because we're always short on pallbearers. <laughs> <laughs> We all it's we're it's it's just like a, a bad dance, you know, too many ladies and not enough gentlemen. <laughs> Cuz we just we never have enough people to carry the coffin. That's funny. 
we're always looking for new people who want to join the group, whether they want to be into reenacting or not, because it is a bit of a daunting hobby to get into from the start. There's not a lot of resources. It's not easy. There's not like a store you can go to and get everything. It's kind of like piecing it together. You know, it probably took maybe like a year and a half before I had like my full like kit of what the basics of what I needed. It, I think it's a little easier for men. Yeah. No offense. I, no, I can totally. <laughs> but it's still a lot and it's expensive. I mean, it's it's an expensive hobby. But also, I think, you know, people who are just really interested in history, people who are interested in volunteering at historic sites, because essentially that's what we're doing when we go to all these historic sites is we're supporting the historic site. If there's a charge for an event, a fee, like all of that money goes to the site. Like we don't ever take a fee for doing any of these events. So it's a way that if you maybe have been interested in, this, you know, volunteering at a historic site and you want to just get your feet wet or whatever, you could come and work at our events. And you don't even, we don't even require everyone who's volunteering to dress in period clothing because we need people who can like move around more easily and do tasks for us when we can't, you know? So um, I'm always saying- Someone who's not wearing a hoop. (laughs) Yeah, that's, you know, because when there's a whole lot of us in one room, it's like bumper cars. You can't do anything or go anywhere, you know? (laughs) So we desperately needed someone to get our lunches to us at Bell Fountain this year. And Michael, who is a wonderful volunteer with the group who is wearing jeans, could go do that for us and get our lunch. You know, even if you're just interested in dressing up, but you haven't gotten started yet, you can definitely help with events if you want to just learn what it's like. And people come and take photographs for us and do all kinds of other things. And then if you want to get involved in you know, the historic clothing aspect of it, we have many experienced people in the group who can help you and help you not like spend your money on things that maybe aren't really worth it, you know, or help you find like used things or, and sometimes people in the group are selling things or make things that, you know, that they can do for you. So it's a resource. I think it takes time to get, it's intimidating and it takes a long time sometimes to put all of that together, um, which I think keeps kind of puts people off of the idea of being in the group, but we can definitely use help from anyone, mm-hmm. even if they don't, they have no interest in dressing up. But certainly it would be someone you, you'd have to have a pretty strong passion for this type of, of topic and, and genre. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if people come in and they want to be a presenter, they don't already have to be an expert, though. Like, we'll give you all the information that you need to talk about that day. Because one of the things that I like about our events is, and people often contact us to do like lectures and stuff, but I like cutting it up because I feel like that's more palatable for people. I don't know if like we have short attention spans nowadays, but I like doing like you go to five rooms of the house and you get like 10 minutes in each room and each person has a different way of presenting it. You know, so you're never going to need to be an expert on like the entire topic of mourning. You're just like, I'm just talking about this, you know, and that's all you need to remember for that day. As a former educator, I can just tell you in general, that's a good idea. <laughs> chunking it up for people's brains and they're going to retain it more. It just works better. Yeah. I mean, I think it just, it's more entertaining that way. I think we draw people in with like the spookiness of it. Like we're all in black and we're in this creepy old house and all these things. And then they get there and then we're like, we're going to tell you about history. But I mean, you can make it fun. But I feel like our draw is that sort of creepiness. And then when they get there, we like sneak all of the educational stuff in. (laughs) Surprise! Here's some leeches. They're creepy, yes, but let me tell you all about why they used leeches to treat people in the Victorian period and how they still use them now sometimes, you know. Well, for me, it's about, you know, I'm one of those, like, if you ever go on a tour with me or take a trip with me, I am that annoying person that is going to sit there in the room with you and go, oh, imagine what it would look like if, or imagine what it would be like if we were sitting here at that time or imagine what that room looked like. I am constantly trying to jump in a time machine and imagine what it was like then. Yeah. (laughs) And you would, when you walk in one of the events that you all do and you see the black over the mirrors and you see the people in the outfits and the historically accurate clothing I mean, that's what I go for, even without the educational stuff, which is a bonus. Yeah. But just being there in that. It's like an atmosphere that we try to build. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That that does it for me. That's why I like when we go to Bell Fountain, we try to keep like all the cars away. We have like some great 
people who have like a horse and carriage that will like drive around like while it's going on um, because we just want to sort of like set the scene. Now, obviously you can't get rid of every like modern thing because not all of those headstones were there in 1865, but you know, I mean, we get as close as we can and sometimes it's impossible to do everything we want to do, but we try to like leave people with an impression of like what it was really like and not like a romanticized idea of what it was like. We definitely had people cry on some of the tours before because I think they go in thinking it's going to be spooky and sometimes it's incredibly sad. Oh, I bet. I, I so bet, especially at Bell Fountain. I remember being really moved. Yeah. The first year that we did the Bell Fountain event, I wasn't in the procession. I was like watching it from the sidelines and we were all like, whoa, we're doing something here. You know, we were watching it and it was like, you know, because it was that was an entirely different event that we had never done before and we'd never tried anything like that and it was it was crazy to see the pallbearers carrying the coffin and everyone following them and it was funny because you could see the tour goers like fanning out like to get pictures you know (laughs) it was like this like movement you know and we always have to be careful how we stage everything during that part because you know you don't want somebody to get a picture of all of us and then like somebody like in their cardinal's hat like standing behind us you know (laughs) Which inevitably happens. So we always have to have like a person who sort of controls the crowd and says like, only stay on this side. Don't go over here, you know, because we want to try to like keep those pictures sort of pristine, not just for us, but for everybody who's there. And so it doesn't like break that. Well, when you see that you're moving someone to tears or or bringing someone to certain emotions, that to me should validate for you all that you're really doing something that is a meaningful yeah and is is powerful and is needed yeah cuz i think there's a there's a tendency to disconnect from like things that haven't happened like in living memory you know how like people can like na- i don't want to say like people make jokes about 911 now more than they used to but it used to be like very taboo but now it's like farther away so like younger people like don't remember it as much so for them it's not you know it's just like people making jokes about the nazis or whatever it didn't happen in a certain period of time and then after a while it started to because people were like not, it wasn't in their living memory like how horrible it was like they know it's horrible but it's not like their lived experience so it's easy for them to make that disconnect and so i feel like when we look back on the victorian period and i think it's especially because when we were working in demonel that we had a lot of people who would talk to us about LEMP, that people were very (laughs) insensitive about the topic because to them it was like entertainment. And it's like, well, these people killed themselves. Like somebody said to me, what did the Demonels do when all of this was happening at LEMP? And I said, well, you know, Nicholas and Emily were dead already, but Alexander probably went there and said, I'm sorry for your loss because that's what you do when someone in someone's family dies. You don't go, oh, I bet your house is haunted now. Let's have a seance. You know, (laughs) that's not, you know, because when you're living it, you're not going to be that insensitive. But when you like a hundred years later, when people go to the house, they say like, show me the room where he shot himself and stuff. It's just, it's strange, but people do disconnect from it. And I think if you get them in a room and like in this instance, one of the volunteers was reading from a diary from one of the Campbell relatives about little Robert Campbell who died of diphtheria when he was five. And it's incredibly sad. It's like this whole dialogue of like, he was fine. He was riding his pony. And then the next day this thing happened and he's not going to live. And, you know, people were crying because it was really sad. But I think you have to sometimes put it in people's face and say these were real people. Yeah, because if you take yourself back to that time period, as much as they were probably better at the grieving process and mourning compared to now, I would say they also probably were not in the habit of sharing their business with the rest of the world. So you might not necessarily have known what was going on in all of these houses. And what you just said also just made me think of one thing that I criticize about paranormal investigation. You know, I love paranormal investigation when I have the opportunity to do it now. But to me, I take it, I try to be as respectful as possible. And when I'm having conversations with someone who may or may not be there, I try to keep in mind that when we walk into the house, they don't necessarily want us talking about, oh, hey, so who died here and who did because it's their people. And so and I also try to not just consume my questioning about their most horrible day or, yeah, well, yeah, you know, about a murder. Like, uh, what was your favorite meal and what was your family like? And, you know, tell me about (laughs) your your childhood. Like, I mean, stuff that people like to talk about. 
Yeah, because you go in there and start asking rude questions. They're going to be like, I'm not talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I just, I, I don't know. I think people have a problem connecting emotionally with like things in the past. Like it's like I'll pretend to them or it's like a TV show or a movie they're watching or something, you know, and it was real. And this helps. I think the morning society can help that. Yeah, you can say like these were and also I feel like people were dealing with so much then that we don't have to deal with now that like, people don't realize like how like people were like, well, kids died all the time back then. So they were just used to it. No, they were devastated, but it did happen all the time. And they were just as mm -hmm. devastated as people are now. There's like whole books that people have written about poetry written about like their daughter that died. You know, people were just because it happened a lot doesn't mean that people weren't affected. And some of them were, like I said, incredibly quick. Like you would catch one of these diseases and the kid would be gone in just a few days, you know. And sometimes, especially in the epidemic years, you would lose all of your children. Like all three children would die within like a, a few months of each other. So, I, I mean, you almost wonder how they got through it. Man, that's a great point. I mean, people do even now. But yeah, but it's, I mean, because you see those gravestones at Bell Fountain where like, there's like the Grisadic children that all three of them died of diphtheria in the 1880s, I think. And they died within days of each other. And so it's just, you, I mean, it's hard to wrap your mind around that kind of loss and that it happened so much, mm -hmm. you know, and not try to like pass it off as like, well, they were just used to it back in the old days. That's why they had so many kids, what they say. Right. I'm like, well, they didn't have birth control either. <laughs> mm -hmm. Side note, you know, since I've been curious about this group, I'm like, Okay, who would I be as a 45-year-old fat man in this time period? And, you know, how would I dress? And I, you know, since the pandemic and having the longer hair and being so beardy, I'm like, you know what? I can see this. Mm -hmm. I could, yes. Who would, my, <laughs> who would my character be? I would definitely have to, this day and age, I haven't worn a lot of like uh, dress-up clothes. So like I didn't have to find some suspenders somewhere and have to... <laughs> <laughs> but the whole well, thing I always say like find a picture because, you know, now online there's like just like huge collections of like historic photographs, daguerreotypes of like mm -hmm. all these really cool, like very schnazzy dressers from. So just like find someone you think is really cool and then you just do that and just recreate it. Yeah, because you can, you know, and even yeah. now you can. I mean, most of the jewelry that I wear is original. You know, you can go find a watch chain. You know, you can just buy those things. And if you look around enough, you can find a lot of things. A lot of things from the Victorian period were mass produced even then. So they're not really like super expensive as antiques now. I mean, it seems like it when you're first getting involved, you're like, oh, I don't want to spend like so much money. But if you if you're discerning and you shop around a little bit, you can find deals on things. You know, you just might not be able to get like the solid gold watch chain. You know, <laughs> you're just going to get like the one that a normal person would have. And the, like I said, the clothing can be expensive. But if you have experienced people that can help you, it can be easier than you think it's going to be. And we have a list of websites where people can go to to look for clothing and, and accoutrements and things. Yeah. Hats. Mm -hmm. Men's hats are very easy because they still make top hats now for like special occasion that are exactly the same essentially as what they were wearing then. Um, and frock coats you can get. There's a lot. I feel like it's, you know, depending on what how deep you want to get. And if you sew. Mm -hmm. And if you sew, yeah. If someone wants to reach out with questions, whether they're local or not local, where do people go to reach out? There's a contact form on our website, and you can also message us directly on Facebook. That's usually the best way. Uh, Morning Society of St. Louis is on uh, Facebook and Instagram for sure, and uh, a really beautiful presence there, but also morningsociety.com, and I'll have all of those links in the show notes. And I want to start with Sherry. And just see if you have any final thoughts. Well, I started doing this because I was very passionate about history. And I love finding out things that I didn't know before. And this definitely gives you a chance to, when you do the research, to just, you know, plunge into it. And this is the group that is very nurturing when you join because you will have people that will that you can ask questions to you will have people that will help you if you have any you know anything that you're if you're stuck at something in your research and can't you know they can point you in the right direction so i've just been enjoying the this group so much and hanging out with these ladies is such a privilege and we would love it if you came hang out with mm -hmm. us too patrick <laughs> it's funny because i was telling my husband joe at dinner i said I can just imagine because you're in this group kind of as a social group, too, because you have common interests and you have friendships 
And so I imagine it's probably weird. You're like, oh, hey, it's nice. Ba, da, da, da. Oh, yeah, we're mourning. That's <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. I forgot. Okay. <laughs> okay, so what are we going to do? Like, I... yeah. <laughs> That's why we have these gaps in between the tours so we can all like talk, mm-hmm. you know? Yes. Where we're like, wait, okay, no one's around. Let's, you know, take our veils <laughs> off. <laughs> Pull your iPhones out. <laughs> beep, 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 beep. We definitely do that when no one's looking. <laughs> So, Catherine, do you have any, or maybe Edna, since you started to talk, do you have any final thoughts? No, I was just saying, when we're talking about that, it made me think about when Catherine and I would meet with John Avery to discuss, who are we going to bury this fall? <laughs> and we're sitting there at Redco to discuss, who are we going to bury, a kid or an adult or whatever? And, and we're talking quiet because we don't want people to be thinking we're a big murder <laughs> or something. <laughs> but it was, it's always fun when we get together and plan these things. It's, it's, it is a fun group. It's uh, a bunch of nice, nice people. I've met some great people through doing this. and. And I just want to throw out there, too, it's not just all morning. Like in May, we're going to be back at the Botanical Garden. We did a thing there last year on the language of flowers, what flowers meant in Victorian times. And we were all stationed at different spots in the garden and talked about different flowers. So that was neat. And then, um, oh, well, for a while there, we were doing suffrage. We still do on occasion, but for women getting the vote, that was a big thing a few years ago. So every now and then we do suffrage events, too, but mainly it's the 1800s era. I forgot about the suffrage mm-hmm. part of it. I'd really like to do more mourning around like World War One. I. I think that would be really interesting because we, mm-hmm. well, and the clothing is so much easier. Mm-hmm. I think uh, for an introduction for a person who's new to reenacting, you can kind of put things together on your own for that time period. And it's not like crazy, but it's also just a really interesting transitional period between like what we think of as like these things that people did in the past and like modern you know, that was when it really shifted into like funeral homes. And when they were on the other side of World War One, they're all like, we're tough now. We're not doing any of that sentimental <laughs> stuff anymore. You know, it's so interesting. I never really thought, you know, Mourning Society of St. Louis doesn't necessarily have to be mourning for the Victorian period. Uh, if you decide to branch out, that is that could open up mm-hmm. a whole other world right yeah, there. Yeah, I'd say we, we really like do. I don't think we would ever go any earlier than like the 1850s, I'd say. And then maybe like no later than like 1920. I like that's kind mm-hmm. of our time period. But like I said, we have the most people with clothes from the 1860s. So that's what we tend to do more of because, you know, it's hard to do that's an event. It's definitely a yeah. big factor in what you can do. Yeah. <laughs> if you want a lot of people you and you have to have the people that have the clothes. So, But as we grow and as people expand their wardrobe, maybe we'll do more you know, things about that. Like you could do something about the Spanish flu. You know, mm-hmm. there's like so many yeah. topics, you know, that we haven't done yet that we can explore. Ladies, I love that I got to hang out with you and I really just want to like um, hang out and be your <laughs> friends now and, you know, crash all of your events. We do have events for just us too. <laughs> <laughs> like just, they, just, we just hang out and we don't always dress up. We sometimes just go places and with your iPhone. With just like normal clothes on. And we're all like, look at you. You look like a totally different person. <laughs> it was really cool to talk to you. And I really do appreciate the work that you do and have a lot of respect for it. And I think, you know, we as a society could use a lot of education on this topic and I know it's it's fun and interesting to us, but I think it could also be very useful. And so I think it's really cool. I want to say good work and I'm glad you did it. And uh, congratulations for what you're approaching 20, 20 years. Yeah, yeah. that's crazy. Wow. But yeah. what are, is there going to be a celebration? Are there any events planned for that? Not yet. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe. We put fun and funeral, though, so we'll, we'll come up with something. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> who, who are you going to kill off for the, the 20 year <laughs> celebration? <laughs> oh my gosh, it has to be somebody <laughs> famous, maybe. I don't know. I kind of like doing funerals for just like normal people. Yes. I feel like this is their chance to get some recognition rather than just like the same old famous people that we always talk about. So we'll see. We'll find someone. <laughs> uh, well, you rock. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. For show notes, including links to anything we may have mentioned in this episode, visit bigseance.com. And you can continue the discussion and hang out with a great community of paranerds by joining us in the Big Seance Parlor on Facebook. Want to hear your voice in a future episode? Go to bigseance.com slash feedback to learn how. Thank you so much for listening. 
Unfortunately, it's time to blow the candles out, but we'll see you and light them again next time. Thank you to the following Super Paranerds who support the show at patreon.com slash big seance. Sue, Jen, Michael Henson, Daryl, Anne-Marie Sullivan, Natalie N., Kim Robb, Josiel Lorenzo, and Susan Davey. My supporters at the parlor guest level who can be found at bigseance.com slash parlor guests are Anne Rekovich from ozparatech.com, Dina DeCastro of Dina DeCastro Astrology, Janae Michaels from Greyhouse Tarot and Farm Artifacts, Amy Park Gedeke of amyparkg.com, Lonnie Scott from weirdwebradio.com, Lana and John of Carbon Lilies, Midge Munster from MidgeMunster.com, Heather N. of DancingBeeAlchemy.com, Diane Razmataz, Stephen St. Amour, Tracy, Andrew Watson, Amy Taylor, Danielle Hembury, Christine Rathselhe, Mindy Kintop, Hope Bataglia, Cass and Bailey, Melissa Armour, Janet Shaw Bins, Bruce Williams, and Christopher Kohler. And I currently have four fabulous listeners who support the show at the $10 level, which isn't even a thing. And those paranerds are Glenna Becker, Peggy Hagen, and Steve and the lovely Judy Skinner. I also have three wonderful listeners who support the show at the completely made up $20 level. And those peeps are Norman and Linda Keller and Kevin Gilbert. Thank you, Paranerds.